Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Iron Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, the International Criminal Court hands down its toughest ever sentence to former Congolese military leader Bosco Tiganda. He faces three decades behind bars for atrocities committed by his fighters in eastern DRC between 2002 and 2003. Also, spring box back into action. The South African rugby champions hit the road with their World Cup trophy to share their victory and symbolise the country's hopes for unity. And we hear from the OECD's development chief about the economic and policy trends across the continent that are helping and hindering hopes for growth and productivity. But first up, the International Criminal Court's handed down its longest ever sentence to former Congolese warlord Bosco Tiganda. He faces 30 years in prison for war crimes committed whilst he headed up the UPC militia in eastern DRC between 2002 and 3. Judges in The Hague said that they'd taken into account the particular cruelty of some of Taganda's actions and choosing to give him the maximum possible sentence short of life. Clément Bonnero has more. Mr. Taganda, in the... Mr. Taganda, please rise. Bosco Taganda showed no emotion as presiding judge Robert Fremer passed his sentence. The overall sentence imposed on you shall therefore be 30 years of imprisonment. The judges gave the Congolese former rebel leader the maximum possible sentence allowed by the ICC, although judges also have the discretion to impose a life sentence. Bosco Tagando was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity in July, convicted on 18 counts including murder, rape, sexual slavery and enlisting child soldiers. The crimes were committed by his patriotic forces for the liberation of Congo, the FPLC, between 2002 and 2003 in Congo's mineral-rich Ituri province. The armed conflicts there killed at least 50,000 people and displaced more than half a million between 1999 and 2005, according to French NGO Doctors Without Borders. Sometimes dubbed the Terminator for his ruthlessness and brutality, Taganda was the FPLC's second in command. The leader of the group, Thomas Lubanga, was the first person ever convicted by the International Criminal Court. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison in 2012. Bosco Taganda has repeatedly denied responsibility for the killings, saying he was just a soldier obeying orders. Prosecutors, however, say he was key in planning and running operations against civilians. Wanted by the ICC since 2006, Taganda voluntarily surrendered to the court in 2013. He now has 30 days to appeal the court's decision. Burkina Faso is facing three days of mourning over the 37 people killed in an ambush on a mining convoy of several buses accompanied by a military escort. No one's yet claimed responsibility for Wednesday's attack. It happened in the east of the country, not far from the Bungu mine owned by Canadian company Samafo. The violence is a symptom of the country's deepening security crisis. About 500 people have been killed since Burkina Faso saw its first extremist attack in January 2016. The military struggled to respond. The government said it's determined to track down those responsible for this latest bloodshed. I have ordered the recruitment of volunteers to defend the country in the areas that are currently under threat. Only a concerted mobilization of the sons and daughters of the nation, regardless of region, ethnicity, political opinion or religion, can defeat these lawless and faithless murderers who dream only to subjugate our country and our brave people to their Machiavellian diktat. Well, South Sudan's rival leaders have an extra 100 days to form a power-sharing government that's key to a peace deal that's meant to end almost six years of deadly conflict. President Salva Kiir and re rebel leader Riek Machar were given more time on Thursday by regional delegates helping with the delicate negotiations. Now, it's the second time the deadline's been pushed back since the truce was signed last September. It's led to a pause in a conflict that's already cost nearly 400,000 lives. And the Springboks have taken their victory parade on the road. The South African rugby team has started a five-day tour of the country to celebrate their World Cup win in Japan. One of their first stops will be Soweto, a township near Johannesburg, where they were once seen as a symbol of apartheid. 
an explosion of joy in Pretoria as the national rugby team kicked off a five-day trophy tour across South Africa. Black and white, male and female, young, middle-aged and old, thousands of residents gave the players a hero's welcome just days after their World Cup victory over England. The sport, like Madiba said, it can unite all nations and then, yeah, we, we're great, we're happy that the box have come back with the cup and then, yeah, we should celebrate and enjoy. It has brought the, the emotions of happiness, uh, love, joy, so we are very happy for the boys. Addressing the crowd earlier on Thursday, Springboks captain Sia Khaleesi said his team's win was for all South Africans, regardless of race and social status. A claim swiftly put to the test as the team arrived in Johannesburg, parading around the infamous Soweto township. 30 years ago, not a single resident would have rooted for the national team. Rugby was then seen as a symbol of Africana oppression. All the players were white, and the Springboks were barred from international competition. Now many Sowetans are proud wearers of the team's jersey. On Friday, the team is expected in Durban. It will then head to East London and Port Elizabeth before their final stop in Cape Town. Now, this week, the African Union and the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, got together to release their findings about the biggest economic and social trends on the continent. The development dynamics are meant to help in coming up with strategies to raise standards of living and increase opportunities for more people across Africa. So for a closer look at this regional checkup, I'm joined by Mario Pettini, the director of the OECD Development Centre. Mario, thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure. Uh, first of all, um, so the continent's doing pretty well. Uh, growth uh, for this year at 3.6%, which is well above the global average. What is it doing right? Well, uh, you said it. There is growth, and it's not only this year. Eh? If, from 2000 to 2018, every year was 4.6% of growth, which is remarkable, just to give you an idea, that in America has been on 26 and this year is only 07 Asia, obviously, is the continent that is growing the most. In those years, it has 76 But I will consider that the 46 of Africa is remarkable. Now, why is so high the rate of growth? Because there is an internal demand. This is even more important, because what will be the global growth this year? You mentioned it. It will be 2.9, and next year, 3%. Trade is not growing. We are at 0.7%. If you wait for investment or for consumers to buy your product from outside, you will uh, lose your time. So now the situation in Africa is very good. And you see also in terms of firms, there are firms, African firms, that are exploding. Production of textile, for example, MTN, is a, producing 8,000 jobs. You have uh, firms that use now Sorgo to produce Eagle beer. And that's an innovation that obviously produces demand additional in Africa. However, the level of productivity remains low. If you compare the productivity of Africa with the one of Asia, then you have 50% of the Asian productivity. So how, how, do you, how do we, as a continent, improve the productivity? I think that there are at least three things to be done. The first is we often mention firms and success cases, but what's making an economy is the small firm. And to improve the productivity of small firm, very often informal firm, we need to address these firms where they already exist. And there are clusters of firms that in many cases have potential. Nollywood that produces all the movie in Nigeria is a good example. Experiences of free zones that have been done in uh, Ethiopia. Yesterday I was with the inventor of these areas. They are extremely successful cases. And why they were successful? Because policy provided those public goods is a big word, but I mean logistic, services for administration of firms, services to control the quality of firms. The small firms cannot do everything inside. So if the place in which they are supply them with these services, obviously they can flourish. And this is the case, but it should be done on a wider scale with appropriate industrial 
policies. The second point is, in Africa, you have many regions uh, that could be better integrated. At present, in Africa, African buys from other African firms only 12% of their trade or of their inputs. So it's very low. It could be improved. And how? Things, for example, production of cars is done in South Africa, but battery are done in Botswana. And then you can have seeds that are done in Lesotho. If you coordinate better these different production across countries that are close, you can increase the capacity of Africa to serve this internal demand. Isn't the free trade agreement going to do just that? The free trade agreement is like providing the water. Then you have to ensure that the horse come and drink. Mm. And to do that, you may say that the agreement is a necessary but not sufficient condition. If you don't have policy that implement the agreement, then obviously the result will be very slow. That's why now a new energy needs to be put in this action, creating this regional network. Another example is tourism in East Africa. Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Rwanda are countries that can provide different supply that if integrated in a kind of chain, then make the region very competitive. Finally, export. Africa has to produce for Africa, and there is an internal demand, which is the big resource when the general economic environment is depressed. But on the other hand, you need to continue to export also outside Africa. If not, you will never compare your product. You will never see if they are really competitive, if you could do better. These are the three directions. Are these all focused too much on, 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 on growth that is driven by, by raising GDP. How does this actually translate into changing the, the quality of lives lived by those at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale? Great question. A professor of mine used to say, uh, looking at a country only through the GDP would be to go and see a doctor and the doctor ask you only about your weight as your, the only measure. I wouldn't like to be judged only on that measure personally. <laughs> now, you can alone. imagine <laughs> countries, how they could react. Well-being is much more than growth. And growth very often does not translate in well-being. So this opened an all completely other chapter, which is what about social inclusion? What about social policy that need to accompany the productivity growth? However, if productivity doesn't grow, you will not have the resources to put in place also the other measure. But okay. you are totally right. Development is not growth. Growth is maybe a condition, maybe a tool, Development is improving well-being of people. Well, thank you very much, Mario Pazzini, for coming in and giving us a breakdown of uh, that report. That is, though, unfortunately, all we have time for on Eye on Africa for now. Thanks for joining us and do so again. Take care. In 1980, a historic strike led by a 10 million strong movement called Solidarity crippled Poland's shipyards in Gdansk. The authorities cracked down on the protest, arresting many and declared martial law. Like Walensa, the leader of the workers' movement, refused to back down. It took seven years to finally force the government into making significant concessions. In 1990, Lech Walensa became president of Poland. This was the first time since 1917 that a communist regime was removed through free elections. Under Walensa's leadership, Poland then transitioned into a free market economy. But everyone hadn't embraced the change. Today, the Solidarity Party has cozied up to the Nationalist Party and its anti-European diatribes. We revisit the fall of communism in Poland, all this week on France 24.